take a couple of minutes to let everybody arrive before we start officially. If you are here, um, feel free to say hello in the chat. It's always great to see everybody's names and where you're located in the world. We have a wonderful international audience. So, oh, hello in the Bronx. So it's 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 good to see see everyone say hello. Um, and thank you for being here today. I'm really excited to learn um, from Nev and get an inside look on the the work that goes into publicizing and promoting a book. So thank you everybody for showing up. Hello in Iowa and Chicago and Oxford, Manhattan and Belfast and Portugal. And hello everybody. Good to see you. Thank you for being here today. Hello in Portland. I, I grew up in the Portland area. Hello in Brooklyn and Illinois and Virginia, Vancouver, Connecticut, Pakistan. Hello everybody. Um, Thank you for being here today. We're just going to wait another minute to give everybody a chance to show up who will be able to show up today um, before we get started. So feel free to say hello in the chat. Um, we are grateful for you and that we're able to, to present these wonderful talks. Um, so thank you again for being here. And um, hello in Toronto. Welcome. We're just gonna wait a little bit longer before we get started. So thank you for being here. Hello, everybody. I am excited. It's a nice um, moderate day in Toronto today. Hello in Australia. I suspect it, is it in the middle of the night in Australia right now? Thank you for staying up. <laughs> Hello in Peterborough in California. Um, yeah, so we're just about to get started. Um, just so everyone knows, we will be sending out a recording with the slides as soon as we can. So you'll be, you'll be able to review that on your own time as well. Um, so hopefully that will take some pressure off the notes, note taking. Um, so thank you again, everybody for being here. Let me pull up my own notes and then we will get started. Hello, writers. This is Jacob Jans with the Writers Workshop at Authors Publish. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Nev March, who will be giving a talk on fun and effective ways to promote your books. This is part of our monthly lecture series where we host talks on the craft of writing and the business of publishing. Mar Nev March's debut novel, Murder in Old Bombay, won Minotaur Books Mystery Writers of America's award for best crime for best first crime fiction. Um, her third book in the series, The Spanish Diplomat Secret, is due to be released very soon. Um, a lot of this talk actually is about the planning, promotion, and effort that Nev has put in to promote her upcoming book. So this is something that is very much based on the real world of book promotion from an author's perspective. Uh, and that's something that's very much necessary, as you'll see, even when published by a major publisher such as Macmillan. So I'm very great, very grateful to you, Nev, for being here today and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. So welcome. How are Thank you? you? <laughs> Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm grateful that you proposed this talk and I'm really excited to be learning today. So uh, whenever you're ready, feel free to get started. Okay, wonderful. Let me share my screen here and uh, let me know if I'm too loud or too soft or anything else I need to do. Maybe move the mic up a little bit. <laughs> there we Sound go. Sound good. Okay, great. So yeah, thank you, Jacob, for uh, you know giving me the space, and uh, so glad that the so many people could come. And I appreciate you, um, wherever you're from. If you got up in the middle of the night, thank you. I will make sure that this is worth your while. <laughs> so I'm going to jump into it. I have about 25 slides. We should have enough time for questions. Please start as you think of them, putting them into the chat, and uh, Jacob will read them to me later. Okay, so let's go. 
Okay, here we go. The clicker does work. <laughs> so this is me. Uh, I was in business analysis. I was an analytics a professional for over 20 years. And in 2015, I got laid off and started interviewing for another role and thought about um, my life. And so I really decided, okay, I'm going to give myself three years and just write, um, engage and learn about this industry and so on. I returned to my passion for writing. I had a wonderful writers group in the Hunterdon County Library. So I strongly recommend connecting with people in your local public library. Um, and lo and behold, these wonderful things happened. It uh, still astonishes me to this day. Um, I'm the first Indian born writer to win MWA's award. And that comes with a contract. The contract is with Macmillan. The, um, the contest is open to all unpublished writers. So unpublished in the crime genre, you may be published in romance or fantasy or sci-fi, but if you have not published in the crime genre, you can enter that um, contest at mysterywritersofamerica.org. Um, go on there and you will find the contest details. They do not announce a winner every year. It's um, three, four years, five years every when they find a good book, essentially, that they want to publish Macmillan. Um, the imprint of Macmillan is Minotaur, and they will publish the book. And then this book did very well. It was national um, you know, finalist for a lot of awards. Uh, I met so many wonderful writers because of that. But I always want to mention that we lost the Audi in 2022. And that is, uh, the audiobook is fabulous. It was uh, narrated, performed by Vic Adam. But we lost to Stephen King. <laughs> so it's still worth something. And that year, President Obama had read his entire 700-page memoir in his wonderful, distinctive voice. So nobody else was going to win that year. <laughs> um, so my debut was published in 2020. Anyone else remember what happened in 2020, the COVID pandemic? So yeah, I launched in the middle of the pandemic. Um, the sequel came out the next year, which is uh, two years later, 2022. And last year, actually, we launched Spanish Diplomat Secrets. So a lot of what I'm sharing is about the launch planning for that book, The Spanish Diplomat Secret, because we learned from the first two books and I learned how to not get crazy uh, trying to do too much. So you're going to benefit from some of the mistakes I made and um, I'm still learning, honestly. So this is each, each um, day, each um, phase of my career, I'm constantly learning. So what are we going to cover? The way to approach this is just think about who we're trying to reach. You cannot reach everyone. And, and that's the truth. You cannot reach even all readers or all readers of mysteries. You cannot reach everyone. So who are we trying to reach? Where are they? How are we going to try to reach them? And then who does what? It is very easy in any relationship, right, to know what you're doing but to not know what your partner is doing in a marriage, in a, you know, your spouse, in your work, in your, um, with your manager, with your publisher, it's very easy to know, oh, I'm doing all these things, but do we really know what the other side, what the partner is doing? And so it's useful to have that conversation say, okay, you know, let's share, here's my piece, what's your piece? And to negotiate a little bit, because again, you cannot do it all. But I think it's important if we're going to be in this market uh, to make it fun, because for me, it's a second career, regardless of whether this is first or second. If you're going to be in it for the long run, it has to be fun. Uh, it's nice if we make a little money, but it has to be fun. Fun is not negotiable. <laughs> So here's the start of the story. Mystery readers, just you know, Google it. Who reads mysteries, right? Who reads crime fiction? They're mostly middle-aged and they're mostly women. Of course, there'll be some men. And yeah, the country, the US is predominantly white. So our readers are going to be mostly white. I'm a diverse uh, author, come from a minority community, but I want to appeal to everybody because I have, my stories have messages in there and it, entertaining and exciting stories for everybody. So yes, we are going to focus a lot, that's why the arrow's there, on the mystery series readers, 
because that is my core audience. This is book three of a series. I just worked on book four. It is due to my publisher in May, book four, and I hope to do a book five. So mystery series, the series reader is important to me. I also have loyal readers who like the first book, 7,000 ratings on Goodreads. So that means something. And I definitely want them to continue because they like the characters and they like the world uh, created or described in that book. So I want to keep them for sure. And then we have, hey, a big fat boat <laughs> ship on the cover. This entire story is set on a steamship. So I'm going to get travel fans, uh, uh, cruisers, you know, people who like cruises. Uh, of course, my series is historical. So there'll be history buffs. That's a target audience I want. Uh, and my main characters are Indian immigrants in the 1890s. So a certain amount of people in the diaspora will be interested as well. Now, this sounds like a lot, right? So we had to whittle it down. But let me tell you how I used some of this to promote the book. Create your hashtags early. And then I save them in Excel, right? So I don't have to rethink them each time. I'm copy pasting hashtags. Why we use hashtags? Social media. Um, is a very large venue, but you find people who are interested in certain topics through the hashtags. People follow hashtags. So I'm not going to constantly use the same hashtags. I'm going to mix it up to try to get a broader audience. And each of these target constituencies um, relate, you can create uh, hashtags that relate to them. So for the ship fans, for example, I had travel, traveler, explore, ship, steamship, cruise, steamer, um, cruising, and so on. And that, if you even followed one of these, you will get my post, right? Because you're allowed 30 hashtags. You don't want to do that many, but Instagram will allow you 30 hashtags. Um, Twitter will allow you a few, it just depends upon the characters. And then Facebook does not do hashtags yet. <laughs> but I wanted to appeal to a wider audience. So here's a preliminary plan, and then I'm gonna tell you how we distilled it and went into the who does what part. Those are the five groups I was shooting for. My loyal readers um, basically are people who had written to me, I had 400 of them, and then people I've worked with over my 25 year career in the professional world, a lot of them still are in touch with me on LinkedIn and so on. So I invited them to join my newsletter. The publisher's newsletter is a great way to go out to the mystery audience because there are people who have uh, an interest in various series, including mine. And then, of course, Mystery Writers of America, because they gave me my start. I'm beholden to them. I love that community. And I'm now president of the New York chapter of Mystery Writers of America. Yeah, you get, got to give back, you know. <laughs> I'm also a member of Crime Writers of Color, the CWOC, which is another very wonderful sisterhood uh, on groups.io. And then I went to my Zoroastrian community. This is an ancient um, religion of the Middle East, and I belong to that community that moved, I guess, to India and then now to the U.S., uh, and there's like five publications. So I said, hey, guys, by the way, I'm putting out my third book. Would you be interested? And of course they did. So I got all five. <laughs> but it's five, right? It's a small group. Uh, the Indian News was interested because my protagonists are Indian immigrants. And I want to normalize having diverse characters as protagonists, as main characters, not as a sidekick, <laughs> not as the gay friend, right? just the main character themselves, because we have stories and why not? It's interesting. Uh, I found that I couldn't really do Facebook groups. It's just time consuming and I, you need to be authentically engaged with a specific group. I found I wasn't going in there often enough to reply to comments. So you got to whittle things down and decide what you can and cannot do. And then, of course, here was my, you know, the, the cruising group. Um, my initial idea was I'm going to pay for every museum will have my book. Now, that didn't happen. Nautiques.com is, is an online um, seller of nautical artifacts. And I had gone to them to get a deck plan, which I actually printed in my in the book itself. So they 
you know, definitely gave me uh, some real estate on their newsletter, Steamship Historical Society of America. Again, because my book had a steamship in it and I was doing research on their website, they gave me a review. Uh, we're doing a bunch of podcasts, mystery websites and so on, just to try to get the crime fiction series readers and younger readers like crime fiction, that term more than mystery. The word mystery, it skews older. And I want to try and get to, to both the audiences. Uh, and I have started doing a certain amount of things on social media, which I will share. And I'll also share what did and did not uh, work for me. OK, for me, it may work for you. So don't uh, take this as, um, you know, the last word. And then lastly, of course, you know, we I did go on social media for um, history, put a bunch of stuff up there. History podcasts are very entertaining and interesting, but I couldn't do the Goodreads groups. Again, you have to be consistent with whatever you choose. Here are some more ideas that we initially threw out and some worked and some didn't work. It's almost impossible to get into an, um, you know, the airlines, the uh, airline magazines or the uh, airport uh, bookstores. Very hard to get in. Uh, to those cruising cruise ship companies. Similarly, very hard to get in, but you know we did pitch those ideas. But I do a lot of library book talks. I just love libraries. And uh, you may think, hey, if you promote in a library, people will borrow the book. They won't buy it. But libraries also buy stacks of books for their shelves and for their book clubs. So you may just you know, it may work, you may get a good sale from it. But I just go to libraries because it's a way to connect with readers. And, and I love that. That's part of what energizes me. So you may say, okay, how do you ask? You have all these great ideas. It's really just one email. And so here's an example. And I'll just take you through. This is someone I already had a relationship with, Don Levitt from Nautiques. So there's a little bit of, you know, continuing the conversation there. And then here's the ask on a separate note, do you have a newsletter to customers where we can share information about my upcoming book? And then a little bit about the book because I want him to want to read it too. And literally, if he just took that text and put it in his newsletter with a picture, I'd be happy. He did more, right? So Don said, hey, send me the book. I want to read it. I'll do a review and then I'll put it out in the newsletter and on my website. And that was wonderful. So you just ask. Sometimes you'll, you know, you'll be happily surprised. <laughs> Not always, but sometimes. Okay, so there's a ton of stuff one can do. How do you know what has an effect? So round, so these are, this is a picture. You can just take it straight off the, the, the screen. It comes down on authors.amazon.com. Um, and I can just get a sense of weekly sales. Remember, this this excludes Kindle and ebook, so it's just um, hardcover and softcover and paperback sales for the different titles that I have. At that time, there were only two. So during Christmas, people buy books for gifts, and mine is a feel-good book. And actually, the whole series is really feel-good series, although it is exciting and um, scary. It, it notches as a cozy so it's a nice gift to give and i did promote to that so during christmas i got this nice uptake all the way from november is this uptake but i did the talk here with jacob at authors publish at the same time i can't separate out the effects but certainly part of this bump is due to that talk because there were like 650 people on the call and then uh, in January, I did nothing, no social media presence, no talks, because I was actually in India at the time. And then when I came back and started to do a little, I just put two posts up and then bingo, there's a little, you know, not spike, but a little bump there. So it's hard to separate these out. You don't know exactly what causes the person, the reader to take notice. But for me, it's fun to do this engagement and um, you know, connect with people and reply to people. It does not take a whole lot of time. I'm going to show you how to do that because it can be a you know a, a, a time sink if you let it. But it is a lot of fun, and that's part of the problem why why it can be a time sink is because it's so much fun. So let's talk about traditional publishers. 
Yes, you get a nice wide distribution, a lovely footprint, but recognize that that's no guarantee of sales. The quality of the book ultimately is what sells it. And also, remember, you're getting a tiny slice of the pie. You self-publish, you're likely to get 60 to 75% of the proceeds. With traditional publishers, it is 12, 15% of your book sales. So recognize that that is a standard issue. They are doing a lot on your behalf and therefore they have to pay for it. So a couple of things that did work, um, the uh, Mystery Writers of America Minotaur Award, certainly here's, you know, I got to go to the Edgar Awards, right? So that's, that's so much fun. And you get a little bit of publicity from that. So here I am with man Nancy Novick and Sajata Massey, who wrote Widows of Malabar Hill and sold thousands of copies. And they're both darling ladies, really nice ladies. And we we got our photograph and we got to be, you know, in all the publications, which is a lot. It was very nice. Um, meanwhile, on the back end, my publisher is putting out Murder in Old Bombay. I have to use acronyms because the titles are too long. Uh, they put out four raffles on Goodreads. And the first was, you know, under maybe 3,000 or so people had entered the raffle for 50 copies. They were giving away free 50 copies each time they did the raffle. That is a huge investment. You know, each copy to produce it is at least five or ten dollars to, to print the book. These are hardcover books with a nice, you know, beautiful cover. Um, the fourth one, there were over six thousand people that entered the raffle. So generating a certain amount of buzz for the book. For Peril at the Exposition, we started just we did just two, so it was a sequel. And they, they were under 4,000 people that were bidding to be in the raffle. And you'll see a sequel always has a little bit lower audience than the, the first book of a series. In fact, when you promote your sequel, your second and your third and your fourth book, people buy the first book because they want to start at the beginning. And that's fun because that's where I want them to start. You know, they, it's so much more enjoyable to read it, to read the series in order. Okay, this is all the stuff that my publisher, Macmillan, is doing. God bless them. And this is a lot. So I'm just going to read through in a few seconds here and tell you who does what here. They had hired professional artists to come up with great cover art. Um, they did a wonderful audiobook. Vic Adam is uh, my rock star voice actor. And I actually, if I click enter, you'll actually hear one minute of him reading the first page of the Spanish diplomat secret. So we'll do that in a second, but let me finish. They gave me a landing page. When I started out as a writer, I didn't have a website. I didn't know how to make a website. So you gotta have some place where, where you can point your readers to buy the book. So they gave me a landing page that says, here's Amazon, here's Barnes and Noble, here's, Kindle, you know, here's all the different places that people can get your book. Um, they did a nice book trailer, which is just a little animated video, 30 seconds or so. It's um, essentially two lines of text and the pictures um, to tease the the books. Um, this is something that they produce and, and do a nice job with it. They put an ad in the Edgar Award book. They sent arcs to influencers. Um, they had the giveaway, giveaways on Goodreads. They did a book bub promo, which brought my first book down to $1.99, $1.99. I have never seen it that low. And it was only there for three days. But that's publicity. And it got people into the series. Then um, we placed my articles, I wrote articles, and the publicity team placed them into online magazines. This is a great way to come up with your audience, an audience that doesn't know you, but knows your genre. So we were going for mystery magazines, whereas, in fact, uh, if you're a romance writer, you could go to romance magazines, too. There's lots of different genre magazines. And then I did two spots in NPR. So I had to do the recording, but they got me that opportunity. So it's a partnership there. They submit the book for awards. They got me a New York Times book review. Fantastic. Uh, you know, I didn't have a criteria for success when I started out. Just being published was enough. But I, I didn't know. Is, is 5,000 copies good? Is, is 10,000 copies good? I didn't know. But 
But I did know that I wanted that one line from the New York Times book review. Uh, and I got a lovely line, which I now use on my posters. Uh, they did Ned Galley, Kirkus Publishers Weekly. I didn't know about these organizations. They are trade organizations. These are how booksellers and libraries buy your books. Um, they did some library marketing. They have a they have a, a newsletter that goes out to libraries, and then they did a video, which I did the I recorded a video, which they then published. Published. I'm going to hit um, enter and let you hear Vic Adam for one minute. This just breaks up the monotony of having me talk for the entire hour. <laughs> Passing at the last of a fine meal. The wind flicked around, snatching at my clothes. Oops. Around me was wet darkness, the splash and hiss of foam. Waves smashed the hull and sent up a spray that hit my face. More seasoned travelers were enjoying their meals amid ships, but I'd known I'd never reached the leeward side and taken my chances at the nearest rail. The caviar I'd consumed only an hour ago tasted sour coming back up. The HMS Etruria rolled until I was suspended high above, like a fly clinging to the top of a ferris wheel. At the crest, it began to dip, nearly upending me. Our hull dropped back into the ocean with a boom. I heaved, but my insides had nothing left to give. Hoping that that did work for you. So let's talk about the author's role, right? It does keep growing. There was a time when you could just be an author and write your books and hand it off to the publisher and you would be done. Um, today, that's not the case. You do need to market regardless of whether you're self-published or so you're an indie author or a traditionally published author. Um, you do need to market. It's just a very, very big market out there. So here's all the stuff we did. Uh, remember, I published Murder No Bombay during the pandemic, but I had 51 appearances, six of them in person. 16 articles were published online, 66 nominations and reviews. I was counting them in the first year. Uh, 80 posts on social media. Sounds like a lot. I did about half that, maybe less than half that for peril at the exposition. Why? Because I was writing book three. <laughs> But I also learned, right? So you do not have, don't worry, this is meant to be blurred. You do not have bad vision. Uh, there was just a lot going on. I didn't want you distracted. There was too much going on for Murder in Obambe. So I cut out on the right-hand side. I cut out Pinterest. I don't post there. I cut out trying to do it every single week. It was just too much. And this is what we ended up with. This is the one that is now in focus. So I'm going to take you through four things that I did um, and, and sequentially. This is going to sound like a lot, but recognize you do not need to do this all at once. You don't need to do it all at all. <laughs> you can just do pieces of it as you, when I was comfortable for you. So let's start with this. I already had a LinkedIn presence. When I started writing, I had about 1,200 contacts on LinkedIn because I had been working for, you know, almost 25 years. And I had connections from all my different jobs there. A lot of them were friends. So I started there. And I don't publish frequently to LinkedIn. I usually link articles, um, something that someone else has written, but I'll make a little comment about it and share it. But it needs to be provocative maybe, or a little bit, uh, a different spin on things, not the same old. My last post on LinkedIn, for example, was billionaires disgust me, but here's one that I admire. And I talked about the billionaire who gave a billion dollars to the Einstein School of Medicine so that students will be tuition free forever, like into perpetuity. My gosh, what a legacy. That's my last post on LinkedIn. Why would people care? Because I have opinions and I like to express them. And maybe if I write and, and engage them, they will then, you know, buy the book. The next thing I did was I hired a 22-year-old, I think she was at the time, who had just come out of college. Uh, she's mentioned here, Laila Sidwa. I hired her to teach me how to use social media. 
youngsters know a lot of cool stuff. So she actually taught me a good bit, and I'm going to share some of those things with you in upcoming slides. Then I learned how to create a website, and we'll talk about that also because there's ways to do it. I made so many mistakes. <laughs> You're going to hear a little bit about that, so you can skip those mistakes. And most recently, I created an email list three, almost four years after my first book came out. I finally got an email list and a newsletter, a picture newsletter that goes out every month. So with LinkedIn, you want to use that space very sparingly. And here's the one most billionaires discuss me. Here's the one I just put up. If you're looking for me on LinkedIn, I'm a business, not a person. Nev March is my writing name. It's my pseudonym here. Um, here is something I had posted because this breaks my heart. This is the seventh or eighth time in the last year or so that in the Indian community, the South Asian community, we've had a murder-suicide. And it stems from this intense competitiveness in the uh, professional community. And I think it affects men much more than the women. Um, but, you know, it can have disastrous results. So I'm talking about... Uh, mental health. I'm talking about this competitiveness. And it, this is, again, this is my social uh, presence, which is why I say I'm book author and social activist, not just, not just an author. And of course, I shared five audiograms, like the one you just heard, on LinkedIn as a launch, um, you know, precursor to my launch. So here's the social media part. There's a couple of slides on here. Lila taught me how to do a little bit of this and make it easy. So it, it, for each post, it was taking me a half hour to find the picture, size it correctly, type out something like a couple of lines, and then find those hashtags and maybe the link to whatever I'm promoting. It was taking me too long. So she taught me about how to save a lot of the links the the content come up with the line quickly and then to plan them all plan two weeks worth in one shot and i'm going to show you that in a second so now it takes me two hours to plan and schedule posts for two whole weeks i use the meta business suite i have a slide coming up there and the twitter scheduling um section it used to be called uh, Tweet Deck or something. Now it's just in the main Twitter X <laughs> um, site itself. And using Canva, when I hit enter, this thing is going to sing again. I learned how to animate my posts a little bit. So it's just a little movement. That's all. It's something to break up the monotony of having a picture. There are reels. There are ways to do videos. There's so much one can do. The only limitation is your time and your creativity. So here's how I schedule things in two hours. Usually a Sunday afternoon, everybody's fed. They're all well situated. The family is all taken care of. And I go to my desk and I look at all the images I've been storing for from research. Typically, when I like an image on Pinterest or on the internet, I put the name of where I found it in the file name so that I can give credit so that I can source it properly. Otherwise, I'll forget, right? I'll have to do a Google Im image search for it. So here are the ways um, ways I do it, right? So you start out with going to your Meta Business Suite. And on the left, there's this little thing that looks like a calendar, which is literally where you would schedule your posts. And then you can click on a couple of places, three places. If you click on the today's date, I was doing this on the 28th of uh, February, I guess, so just a week ago or so, uh, you click on this spot, it will bring up this uh, little, you know, pop up. Or you can go to schedule, that's the second place, or you can go to the right hand side where it says create posts. Any of these three will bring up your pop up box. And there you're going to insert an image, you're going to write one line, short text, you're going to copy paste those hashtags that you saved already. You do this one time, go into Google and type in best hashtags for crime fiction series, and it will bring up dozens. Save those, save those, save those, call out things that don't make sense. 
and then you're going to copy paste them in here. And finally, if you're promoting a talk like I did for this one, put the link in for people to register. Otherwise, they'll be pinging you. How do I register? How do I get in? <laughs> so you want them to easily take action. And finally, I'm going to say, if readers leave comments, respond. I respond to every email I ever get. <laughs> so because somebody took the time to write to me, I'm going to at least respect that with a reply. Um, on Twitter, uh, X, <laughs> I still call it Twitter. Uh, you know, some people have dropped out. That's fine. I do put a little bit more political content on here. Um, I express my opinions. Some people won't like that. Well, that's going to be just too bad. <laughs> so you go into the left and you hit click on the blue button post it brings up this pop up. And there you can type in exactly copy paste what you had for your other post. But don't hit post right away because there's this little teeny tiny icon. That's your scheduler right there. And that will tell you which day you want to place that post on. And I basically mirror them. Whatever I've got on Facebook and Instagram, both of them are controlled on Meta Business Suite, as well as groups. I can put it to a group as well. So two of those and Twitter, everything mimics whatever I'm planning to do for that day. And I'll put out two weeks at a time. For every event, I'll publish it two or three times because people aren't always on there. They may get in the morning, they get in the evening. And, and every time that I do have a recording, like the recording of this event, I'll try to publish that at least a couple of times so that people can, if they missed this opportunity, they can go and, and see it later. Um, so here, she, let's talk about the website. Okay, this was number three. And I did this kind of late. Um, I started with Wix because it was $45 a year and it had this interface that was easy to use. It had a template so I could just literally type in and bring in my photograph and it was done. Um, but within six months or so, it sold my site and a bunch of others to Vistaprint. So I had to learn the Vistaprint system. They had an interface and I was able to use it. I got on help desk a couple of times. They sold it to Webs. And now my price per year was going up to $320 a year. Okay, so I decided, okay, this is not happening. I'm not spending this, even though I like my website. It had a lot of good stuff on it. I rebuilt the whole thing over Christmas. I rebuilt the whole thing on WordPress. And I'm back down to $40 a year with the $12 domain cost, $50, 52 bucks. Um, I can afford it. I'm still a starting out author. I can't be spending $1,000 on, on this kind of stuff. So I will say, if you don't have time or interest, some people just aren't as interested, hire a professional, get it done one time, a simple version, set up a basic one. Really, all you need is a little bit about your books, how to buy them, you know, and a little bit about you, a bio. That's, that's really the basic parts of your website. I also have a scrapbook because I want a few pictures on there. I have a little story uh, about going to the actual Rajabai Tower in Bombay University because it was a very scary event <laughs> and it's not open to the public. So I put that up, but you don't have to have that kind of little additional stuff. All people want is stuff about your books and stuff about you. And then, you know, you, I track my views. So, you know, 60 visitors in a week. Okay, some weeks there'll be more, some weeks there'll be less. But, the, but that's not the end goal, to have visitors on the site. The end goal is to have people who enjoy the book. So get them to the book and uh, engage with them when they tell you they've enjoyed the book. Uh, the fourth and last piece that I've just done is my newsletter, the author newsletter. I started it on MailChimp and I pay about $26 a month for this. Uh, I had been saving all those emails over three years, about 400 people had written to me and I replied to each one of them. So I invited them to join this newsletter. It's a monthly picture newsletter, so most people did. And then I invited my 1400 colleagues and friends from my, my Rolodex, my 
uh, contacts, invited them to come join. And we now have about 1,200 uh, people on my monthly newsletter. And so why, why would anyone subscribe? You have so many of these. I realized people subscribe because they know you or they want to know you. And so that's literally what my newsletter does. It adds, it, I have a few things in there that say, literally three things, something about what I'm doing, maybe one picture, hey, I'm going to talk on Authors Publish, one, one line um, and a picture and a link. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm doing in my writing world. Um, there's information that they will get before everybody else. Um, and then finally, some recommendations of other writers' books. I promote other writers' books, books I've read, TV series I've been watching, uh, and I ask them for recommendations. So keep it short. If you're doing a newsletter, do not write paragraphs. I don't read them when I get them. Uh, I read the first and the last paragraph typically, and, and therefore I try to keep mine very short. And use some pictures, make it fun, make it personal. Uh, ask no more than five minutes of a person to read your newsletter. And now what do I want to do? See, this is going to sound like a lot. But like I said, you don't have to do it all. And you don't have to do it all now. Each time you get good at stuff, it gets easier. Learn something new. So I like doing podcasts. I just did one with history, books, and wine. A fun podcast. Uh, and we talked about cruising predominantly, what is, and, you know, naval history or nautical ships history and something about my characters, their histories. So lots of fun there. Um, library book talks I've been doing consistently and I enjoy that. I want to do more. I haven't done school book talks, but that's another fun place to go because I think we want to encourage people to read for pleasure, read for fun. Read for enjoyment, read for learning about the world, and of course, book clubs. I'd love to get into more book clubs. So what motivates authors? What makes us happy? Um, when people like our books. <laughs> and then if I can pay my bills and I don't have to scrounge, I'm even happier. So the big question is, how can I do all this? And I'm going to say... Do what you can comfortably because you're also writing. And there will be days when you're writing and don't do any promotions. Perfectly okay. And if you take a week off from sending, putting out social media stuff, hey, that's fine. The sky does not fall. Here's one of those wonderful letters. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But he said, um, just came in last week. I read your first book and enjoyed it immensely. Then he talks about my second and third book. And then he says, please write another dozen. I will read them all. Okay, this keeps me going for weeks. I'm walking on air. <laughs> so back to you know where we started. The fiction market is incredibly crowded with self-published and traditionally published books. Uh, if you do a Google search, it'll actually say 4 million, but I think that's worldwide. So I know as of 2021, it was 2.3 million new titles every year. But growing my brand as a writer, as an author, it helps my publisher, keeps them in business, helps them grow, and it helps me stay in business as a writer. So how do I use my time, right? That is the biggest question and really the only question uh, as an entrepreneur. We need to be efficient and creative. If this is a burden, don't do it, okay? Don't do it. Don't kill yourself. Life is too short. Really, we need to have fun with this. So if you are having fun, learn something more, try something, scratch your brain a little bit, but, um, you know, have fun doing it. And best of all, make have partnerships with other writers, with your publisher, uh, appreciate your partnerships. I think I'm ending there. Yes, to join that newsletter of mine, you can go to nevmarsh.com. About me is the picture one which has my picture on it. And yeah, go ahead and click in there. It allows you to join the newsletter. You could also send me an email and I will add you to the newsletter. Uh, it's nevmarchauthor at gmail.com. So thank you all for being here. I'm leaving a little bit of time for questions. Okay. Nev, thank you so much. That Welcome. was um, 
Very enlightening. It was inter- interesting to see like the, the real work you've done to like promote and sell your books. Um, yeah. And like seeing the, like the real numbers associated with that. I, I like numbers. Um, I'm maybe not normal for a writer, but <laughs> I, I like think that, yeah, that was <laughs> very fascinating. Um, and I also like what you said about how you really, um, engage with your readers. Like you, you, you reply to emails and you build that relationship. And I, I think that that's a big deal. And, um, our experience at Authors Publish, I think is similar. We also, we reply to every email and like you end up building these relationships that, that last. And yeah, I, I, that's, I think that's an important part of the process. Um, for those of you who have questions, um, you can post them in the Q and A button in Zoom. It should be on the bottom of your screen if you're watching this live. I'm going to ask as many questions as we have time for. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. We have a question from Jennifer Wilson. Um, can you speak to the different stages of the publishing journey and when those activities happen relative to that path? For example, the pre-publication, the publication date and the post-publication? Absolutely. So the day I turn in the book to my publisher, Um, is when I start thinking about how I'm going to promote. And that's typically 9 to 12 months away from the actual Mm -hmm. publication date. But um, we don't engage, the publisher and I don't have our conferences, our Zoom meetings, until about six months before the the launch date. So uh, when I give, when I turn in my book, they are going to, the publisher, editor, and editing assistant are going to take about six weeks to digest it and give me back revisions. So I will get another, you know, there's another pass, another pass is like two passes as a proofreading pass. So six months go just with that back and forth. But I'm thinking about audiences. I'm engaging with um, libraries and book talks and online uh, presence like this throughout because I'm promoting the previous book while yeah. this book is being prepared. As we approach the six months before launch, that period, that's where the uh, publisher is doing a lot of stuff. So that whole slide I showed you that, you know, had all the different things um, that the publisher does, they give me a schedule. We have this meeting, they'll put the schedule together. And in that schedule includes things they're expecting from me. Mm -hmm. And which months they expect it from me. They Mm -hmm. expect a short story in such and such month. They expect, they want to put me out in criminal element. That's their newsletter in certain months. So I want to, they want an article from me and so on. So those are things that go onto my calendar because even though I'm writing and revising and editing, I'm very Mm -hmm. punctual to every single deadline. Um, I don't miss a deadline. I just don't. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And and it, um, if that means I don't get much sleep, so be it. It's only for a couple of days, right? It's only yeah. a couple of days. I can sleep tomorrow. Um, but that is the period where they're putting out a lot of pre-launch seeding activity, the Goodread stuff, the ARCs, um, the yeah. raffles, the newsletters are all going in in the couple of months, two months before the actual launch. And the launch itself is usually online, you know, with a bookstore maybe or a large library will do something like that. Mm-hmm. And then there's a sequence of publications of announcements. So this is where I go into my Zoroastrian news, the Indian news, and a lot of those things will happen right after launch, the one month after. Um, And usually by that time, I'm already cooking the next book. (laughs) So at some point, you know, maybe two, three months after I start really weaning off and just do those regular posts on social media and really just focus on writing. Uh, There's a phase for me, which is the drafting phase. See, the research phase and the revising and editing, I can multitask beautifully. The drafting phase is three to four months where my brain is just occupied by the story. It's just, it's it's 100% occupied. There's no space for anything more. And my family has to feed me during that time. <laughs> They have to knock and, you know. They should. <laughs> yeah, they, they feed me. They make sure I go on walks. I'm, I'm kind of luggage at that time. Yeah. <laughs> so not very functional mother, but luckily I've grown kids. So thank God mm-hmm. for that. They can take care of themselves for a few months. And and I really get very into the book and the research and the 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 characters 
and the plot and I'm reworking and putting in subplots and layering on and there's just so much there that for those three months I don't do any publishing like, like no promotion at that time mm -hmm. if I have a you know half an hour I might go in and put in some social media posts but that's it so hopefully mm -hmm. that gives you a sense of where these things are yeah um yeah that answered some of my questions as well um so so when you're when you're writing it seems like you just get into the writing and you don't worry about all that so much those three months yeah. just three maybe four months of drafting I'm really focused it's, and I'll do minimal amount of work and really minimal amount of promotional work it's really just social media for me what, what's your what's your writing schedule when you're in the that three months sort of drafting so period? I'm a late bird I'm not an early bird there are people who get about five o'clock god bless them I don't know how they do it <laughs> So I, I work late. So I get up late um, during those those three months, and maybe nine o'clock even, or sometimes even 10 o'clock, believe it or not. And then I will uh, start with business, take care of whatever commitments I have, like those you know articles, things that are due, I will put those out. By noon, my brain is actually on. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah. I always say, but hey, that's the way my chemistry works. And that afternoon blows by. That's why I say they have to tell me that it's time to eat. Um, because I, I actually forget, I forget these things. I actually run to the bathroom too late <laughs> frequently because I forget I have to go to the bathroom mm -hmm. and it sounds absurd, but when you're so <laughs> focused, <laughs> yeah. you're so focused, you keep postponing it. Like, you know, no, I'll get this done and then I'll go. It's insane. But yeah. Uh, and then I will usually take a little break because the family comes home around that time, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, take a couple of hours off. And then I restart from 10 o'clock to 2, 3, or 4 a.m. because the house is quiet. And that's my best time. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I will keep going as long as I'm not falling over. Um, I try to stop and then ah, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. <laughs> I'm a glutton. Nice. <laughs> and well, no wonder you get up late or gets because you're writing in the night. Um, I'm curious about um, your your outreach efforts to the various organizations. Um, that's something that that you take on, and the publicist at Macmillan. I assume they do some as well. Like, do you coordinate with them about that? Yeah, I tell them what I'm doing. I frequently copy them on stuff because if I'm successful, they will need to send out a copy. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally, I'll use. I get a few few free copies, so I'll send those out, out as well occasionally. But usually, it's um, I'm emailing nautics.com, for example. I'll copy my publicist Hector on it, uh, and when they reply, people frequently forget to reply to the copied people. They'll only reply yeah. to me. Yeah. So yeah, um, I'm coordinating some of this, but I realized very early on that the publicist from the publishing company they have too many people that they're supporting. Mm -hmm. So while they did a lot for my debut, they didn't do as much for book two and three because now I'm quote unquote established. So I do it. Yeah. I do it because <laughs> I know how to do it now. Yeah, and, and I copy them and uh, there are some things I cannot do. And then I'll ask them, hey, you know, can you go do this? Uh, there's a book club service, for example, that, you know, I don't know how to do that. So I'm going to ask him, ask the specialist. I use them for the hard stuff, the stuff I cannot do. And then the easier stuff, the stuff that I know how to do now, I'll knock that out and just copy them. Uh, and then when we have this, you know, meeting, the the launch planning meeting, which is six months prior, I'll share this is my plan. So they know what mm -hmm. I'm contributing as well. It almost seems like one of the benefits of a big publisher, which I hadn't quite thought about before, is that they can train you in a lot of these things about publicity. Like you're going to get that knowledge from them. And, and I guess they're also expecting you to use that knowledge subsequently. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, I don't think they really trained me too much because I hired my um, my 22 year old mm -hmm. uh, friend Lila to do that at least on the social media side. They don't ask me to do it. I'll be quite honest. They say just have a basic uh, website and so on. Yeah, yeah. But I do know that it has a massive ROI. So uh, the the key is they do a PDF one pager, which is very nicely formatted. I could learn how to do that myself as a pub as a writer. 
but it will take that much longer. And yeah. I don't really don't know, right? You mm -hmm. don't know the things that you don't know. Yeah, so yeah. it's nice that they do those things and then I use them. I use the one pager, I'll use the um, little one minute audio clip when I'm sending something out to, you know, whether it's a museum or whether it's a bookstore, I'll add those attachments just to no more. Uh, my first attempt at creating a press kit, I put every link I could think of. It was four pages long. Yeah. And nobody reads that, frankly. Mm -hmm. It just looks so clunky. Yeah. Um, now I just use the two NPR links because mm -hmm. uh, National Public Radio. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a well-regarded brand, so it, it gets attention, right? And the New York Times blurb that, that you mentioned. Love that, yes. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Hussein who is talking about um, how maybe the, does the promotion start in like laying out the book to engage the several different audiences? And when at the beginning of your presentation, you were talking about like all the various different audiences you thought would be a good fit for the book. Mm -hmm. And I, I was wondering this as well, when, when you were do you think about those audiences before you write the book or was that totally after the fact? It's after the fact. So when I'm writing uh, the story, it's the story that's dominant. I'm not deliberately placing the action on a steamship because I can get the cruising audience. Uh, you know, I, I'm not that smart. <laughs> so yeah. I just write the story. Basically, mm -hmm. I have fun with it. I had this idea for a um, locked room mystery on a steamship so the killer can't leave, right? He's got to yeah. be there. So, so I had that idea in my head for like a couple of years, at least three or four years. And um, after the fact, I think about, well, who would be interested in this? And then that's how you segment out the mm -hmm. different constituencies. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it seemed to me that you like were really good at understanding those different constituencies and really thinking clearly about that. And that, that seems to be like a really smart way of knowing who to approach in terms of the publicity efforts. I think you have to be choiceful. And because there's so much one can do, one has to be very careful. And, and strategy means saying no, you have to make choices. That's the point of strategy. If you did it all, well, you'd run yourself into the ground, but, but, but also it's it's not feasible. Some things are going to be easier and quicker and have more ROI. And sometimes you're yeah. guessing at that. I'm guessing at it a lot of the time. Um, we have a question from Aura who says, you chose to work with a conventional publisher, even though, as you said, you get a smaller percentages of the sales when you work with them. Judging by your wonderful speech, it seems that it worked well for you. Um, my question, are there pros that you can see to independent publishing? Have you have you thought about self-publishing or going with like an indie press? I have, and I may yet. Um, so I have four unpublished manuscripts that are sitting in my drawer. And two of them, I think actually I could dust off and make a few fixes. Mm -hmm. They're from 2005 and six. Okay, so they're dated. But I didn't have certain skills then that I do have now. And so I may yet self-publish two of my historicals that they probably are between historical fiction and historical romance. That's mm. probably their category. And that's not what my publisher does. Minotaur is crime fiction. Yeah. So um, probably what I will do is first offer them to a Minotaur to give to Macmillan because there are uh, romance publishers or historical fiction publishers uh, imprints within Macmillan, which is a very big umbrella. Uh, offer them there and see, and you know, if there's really not good traction there, I may just end up self-publishing because I like those stories. I, yeah. I just like them. You know, the fact that I it's been years, almost 20 years, you know, in, in a couple of years, it's 18 years since I put that the last one aside. And and I still think that think about that story. I like the story. So I may, um, those two, I may actually self-publish. There are pros. Definitely, mm -hmm. you have much more control in that sense of your pricing. Um, your, um, you know, you're getting a large chunk of the sales. Even with a hybrid publisher, you can get a very good um, share of the, the proceeds. So I'm right now in women in 
publishing, it's an online summit. It's called Women in Publishing Summit. Um, and it's uh, it's sort of a closed group right now, but it's every year. Uh, Alexa Bigwarf is the one who does this. And I'm learning a lot about the self-publishing and hybrid mm -hmm. publishing industry because I may end up doing that yeah. for these two books. Um, but I, I will tell you, you do need to have some presence. If you're going to self-publish, um, you have to have some platform or some presence because there are just so many self-published books out there. It gets very hard for a reader to find you and it gets extremely difficult for an indie author to gain that kind of presence. Has been done. It certainly has been done. Uh, and then sometimes that same book can be picked up by a traditional publisher. I mean, The Martian, everyone remembers the movie. That was a self-published book. What a yeah. brilliant idea. I mean, just, just fantastic idea and execution that was self-published. So it can be done. Um, you know, you do need some presence and some credentials for that mm -hmm. to work. Yeah, I, I've noticed like I've noticed some genre authors that I read, they sometimes like release shorts under like a different publisher or even self-publishing. And that seems to be like a way that they can sort of step their toes into that. Yeah. But then they also have a lot of loyal readers who will read anything from them. So um, yeah, so we're just about out of time. Let's maybe get... Um, one more question. Um, oh, a quick question. Has your book been option? Any of your books been optioned for film? Not yet. Not it yet. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, we've had a lot of bites, uh, but historicals tend to be big production, you know, big budget. Mm -hmm. And it's also most of it set in India. So, you know, there's a limited number of people who can produce something that big. So we've had a lot of nibbles, a couple of important you know, screenwriters are big screenwriters are looking at it uh, to convert it into a screenplay. I'm trying to learn how to, to study and, and to write screenplays myself. I think it's a fun medium. It's very different than writing novels. So yeah. uh, very different, but I, it's something I want to do. Not yet been optioned, so it's available. Oh, that, that, that's interesting that there's been discussions, but not options. I, I'm not, I don't really know much about how that works. Can you, can you explain a little bit? Like, how the, so the I'm process, learning to, yeah I'm learning to and I have very limited experience with this but here's what I know um you are offered a, an option means that that entity which is usually not the production company these mm -hmm. are sort of um you know people that are third parties uh, that are bringing people together they will take your book and option it for uh, you know offer you a certain amount of money to have exclusive rights to create the screen, whatever, either the movie or the TV series. Mm -hmm. But you get that amount um, for a certain amount of, you know, maybe a year, two years, three years. You option it for that period. If it is sold, you make an additional amount. And frequently in the option agreement, they're telling you, you know, I'm giving you this amount, but if it is sold, you will make this amount. They'll actually mm -hmm. tell you right up front. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's just I'm giving you a certain amount of the option. As in when you sell it, you get one to two percent of the entire budget, whatever the movie budget wow. is. That's that's the standard way to, that it goes. But you have to be OK with the person that you're in the contract with because it is exclusive. Once yeah. you've given that person the option, you cannot give it to someone else. If for those two years, mm -hmm. they have the right. So I'm very concerned about who would produce this. Yeah. You know, I would love for like a Julian Fellows kind of, you know, big budget, um, um, like Indian Summers or something like that. Um, and, and therefore, you know, they have to be able to deliver quality. That's really what I'm looking for. And yeah, if it takes a few years, it takes. The Henna Artist is a book that came out in 2008 that's only now, you know, coming to fruition as a production. So, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, if it takes 10 years, that's fine. It takes 20 years, that's fine too. That's, that's fascinating. Well, I hope it gets picked up. Thank optioned. you. Thank you. Um, we are out of time. Um, thank you again so much, Nev. And if people would like to join your email list, uh, let me, I think, let me put the link in the chat right now. And we'll also send a link out with the recording so everyone can join your email list and buy a copy of the, fir the first in the series, Murder in Old Bombay. <laughs>
of your, your wonderful books, um, which I do regularly see in our local bookstores, which is great. So thank you, Nev. Um, is there anything you would like to say to the audience before we're done? Uh, what I'd like to say is, you know, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, listening to me. And uh, I'm happy to answer any other questions you have. You just go on my website and uh, send me a note. And I promise you, I will reply. Maybe not immediately, but I will reply. That's wonderful. And thank you again, everybody, for being here. And thank you to everyone behind the scenes at Authors Publish who make these talks possible. Um, and all of our supporters who have helped fund these talks. So thank you, everybody. And if you have any questions for me, you can always email support at authorspublish.com. Thank you again, Nev. Thanks.